generator, if there was a question mark, most likely we're going to scrap this. Their cut and keep list may have been easy to make, but the true challenge still lies ahead. They'll need to systematically dismantle the locomotives, cutting through solid steel without damaging the internal components or their auxiliary parts. A locomotive is designed to be almost indestructible. In this case, a 160-ton construction of cast and welded steel. Each piece must be taken out with precision, by hand, with blowtorches. The breakup will happen from the top down in three stages. Stage one, the strip down. Cut and skin the steel outer shell of the locomotive to expose its power core. Stage two, the gut out. Remove the locomotive's internal workings, the prime mover and generator. And stage three, the final breakdown. Cut away the cab and torch through the over seven centimetre thick solid steel locomotive bed to salvage the wheels and supports. It's a job that takes experience, skill and a healthy respect for locomotives. Rich Dawson's the man for the job. Iron, cast iron. You can tell by hitting it. Sound. He's been in the business over 30 years and knows how to handle a fuel tank. You know how a sign, that's when it's empty. Oh, yeah, some of them, I cut, I cut, I cut a lot of these up, a lot of them come and pull, uh, pull about 3,500 gallon of fuel in them. Yeah, I have it pumped out. Oh, yeah, I'll catch on fire. But fire's not the only risk. Come on, George. Rich and his team are dealing with 160 tons of locomotive. An accident with even a smaller component could crush anything or any body in its way. A couple of old there caught him at the slam Rich knows this from experience. Here, here. They snapped them fingers off right there. In 1966, he was hooking up a pair of locomotives when they moved together and took a third of his hand with them. They didn't even smash them from here up. Just pinch them off. I could, I could took them and pull them off like that. But Rich got his revenge. Since then, he's cut up over 5,000 locomotives, and he's itching to get started on this one. Rep, you can't hear on this other side. No, right here. here. This thing's way too heavy. No, 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 no. You can lift it over that thing. Right. Here. Come all the way across. Right. Number 672 will be the first to go. From trucks to sedans, she's hauled freight for the auto industry for 40 years. But today, her time is up. Take it out, put it down. Rich calls in his troops. They get straight to work on stage one, the strip down. First, Rich needs to cut off the doors and rails. He shows the cutters where to begin. Okay, cut some doors off so we can see to get up in there and cut them bolts off. Now, hey, let him cut in half. The rails and doors may have come off easily, but the strip down's only just begun. Rich and his team get ready to rumble. It's a scorching day in the breakdown yard. And now it's about to get even hotter. The team needs to cut through layers of over seven centimeter thick solid steel. And blow torches are the only way to do it. The flame is 50% acetylene gas and 50% oxygen. The only mixture that burns hot enough to cut steel. At 3,480 degrees Celsius to be exact. Direct contact with this heat could be deadly. So each worker must wear a face shield and protective clothing called leathers. But the flames aren't the only hazard. A machine this old is a potential powder keg. 
Oil and fuel residue are all over this locomotive. One wrong move with a blowtorch could ignite an explosion. So Rich must make sure his team stays clear of any residual combustibles. Working at Rich's side is Billy Tolocco. He's new to Ehrman, but not to the rail industry. His old job was with a train derailment team. When a train crashed, he cleaned it up. Scrapping this out, it's all new to me. This is my first locomotive. He's hoping to take over for Rich at the end of this project. I got all of them, Rich. Huh? I got all of them. Got them all. This is Rich's last breakdown. He's 70 years old and headed for retirement. But Billy will need to learn Rich speak if he's going to follow in the master's footsteps. Is that five foot? Yeah, he better whack at me. Translation, Rich wants the team to keep cutting. He knows they've got a lot of work to do. There's not one, but two 160-ton locomotives to cut down, and they've only just begun. As the torch burners slice through the steel shell, Billy begins removing any exposed cabling. But these aren't your everyday wires. These two and a half centimeter cables are packed with copper threads. Oh, this one's stubborn. Oh, oh you got all two of them. You got a, there you go. Now you got it. You had all two of them. Okay. Number one copper right there. A locomotive this size has about 200 kilograms of copper wiring. At current prices, this could mean over a thousand dollars for the Roth brothers. But under 672's shell, there's even more potential for profit. Her engine and generator could fetch over a quarter of a million dollars. That's if Rich and his team can get to them. But so far, the strip down is on track. It's the first stage of the locomotive cut down. Rich Dawson and Billy Tolocco must remove 672's shell to expose her internal workings. The temperature is approaching 35 degrees. But so far, Billy's enjoying himself. You know, I love it, you know, and I enjoy the weather. You know, I just love it, you know. I love it to death, you know. Inside the office, Ehrman's co-owner, Ted Roth, puts calls in to prospective parts buyers. Jim, how are you? Ted Roth calling with Ehrman Corporation. Say, I wanted to chat with you about some locomotive equipment we've got available for sale. Any component Ted doesn't sell will go for scrap. It was rebuilt in 2000. To the uninitiated, the term scrap implies a low value, a throwaway commodity. But scrap metals, particularly steel, have been the building blocks of industry for decades. Now, with improved recycling technology, the demand for scrap is even greater. Technology has come a long way in the recycling industry. And as a result of that, we're going to go back and start touching things that once upon a time was regarded as garbage. As an example, landfills. It wouldn't surprise me at the least within our lifetime that we'll start to see re reclamation of landfills for no other reason but to go and reclaim metals, plastics that can be recycled. Thousands of new products are made with recycled metals every year. So it's a very good time to be a scrap dealer. And a locomotive is pretty much all metal. Ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Ferrous being steel, non-ferrous being the copper and aluminum and brass that we would find on the locomotives, um, are at all-time highs. Prices that we've never seen before. Maybe never see again. That means every chunk of steel off this locomotive is worth recycling. Rich's team cut the doors and rails away from number 672. Next, they start on the two and a half centimeter thick steel shell that covers the locomotive's internal workings. Carefully, it's cut away from the bed. It takes three hours to get the job done. Got everything cut and everything ready? Everything's cut and ready. Everything cut and ready. Let's go, bring the crane. Now they prep the skin for crane operator Roy McNish to lift it off. All right, ready, let's go. His task is going to be tricky. 
The pieces are big and bulky. Any uncut metal or cabling makes his job even harder. Finally, he removes all the pieces. They're steel, so they're headed to the mill for scrap. But first, the team must crush the oversized pieces into manageable chunks. And Ehrman's got the right tool for the job. The 370-ton 1123 Harris guillotine shearer. Like an oversized jaw, it crushes with 1,000 tons of downward force. Then a 90-kilogram hardened steel blade slices through the crushed remains, spitting out 60-centimeter steel cubes. The cubes get weighed before shipment to the steel mill. To earn its keep, this hungry monster needs to process up to 245 tons of steel a day. So it's fed on a constant diet of rail cars. Ehrman is set up to process the rail cars like a production line. First, they remove all the salvageable parts, the brake systems, couplers and wheel assemblies. Next, a torch team cuts horizontally along the steel frame. Then a forklift operator flips the top off. And the torch crew cut up the pieces. When they finish, a crane swoops down to feed the remains into the shearer. And the next car rolls in. The yard's train designs range from covered hoppers, tank cars and flatbeds to double-deckers. But no matter what the shape, if it's on Ehrman's lot, it's history. And the pair of newly arrived locomotives are no exception. As number 605 waits for its turn, Rich and his team finish removing 672 skin. Go and blow them both or dump that thing off. But skinning this loco is the easy part. The biggest challenge is yet to come. The team must still remove over 4,000 kilograms of components. It's time for stage two, the gut out. In the Ehrman breakdown yard, veteran cutdown expert Rich Dawson has already stripped the first locomotive, number 672, down to its diesel engine and electric generator. The team has their work cut out for them, removing these power plants. First up, the massive 14 and a half ton diesel engine. It generates 3,000 horsepower that can pull up to 4,500 tons of freight. This energy is transferred to a generator, where the power is converted to nearly 4,200 amps of electric current, enough to power the locomotive's wheels, or the equivalent of 1,000 households. Now these parts are all exposed, and that's exactly how Rich wants it. Are you ready? Bring your torch. Go ahead and cut this off here. The team's ready to start gutting out this locomotive. Each component will come out piece by piece. But like everything else on this locomotive, these parts are huge. And there's an added challenge. Ehrman's owner, Rob Roth, wants to resell the locomotive's components. 
so they've got to come out intact with all the connecting hoses and parts attached. Rob's already got some buyers interested in the engine, so it will come out first. Pull that bottom on it. Pull that bottom on it. The team must work quickly. Rich and his crew finish cutting the network of copper cables that connect the diesel engine with the rest of the train. Hard man, he's a hard man. Rich's protege, Billy Tolocco, has it under control. Wear yourself out here. One more, that's it. Copper is the most valuable metal on this locomotive. A lot of copper. All the wire will be boxed up and sold. With the engine cables disconnected, the workers begin cutting the engine free from the locomotive so a crane can lift it out. You tell it, let him do it, don't you do it, let him do it, okay? The engine's worth a quarter of a million dollars, so there's a lot of money on the line. Rich knows the cuts must be done carefully. Now you don't want to mess this frame up. You can't cut into the frame. You do, you destroy the whole thing. The torch burners must cut the bolts securing the engine block to the steel bed. But if they cut into the block, they risk damaging the component and reducing its value. Well, if you go out, if you go on salvage, you, you got to be careful where you cut. The burners work right on top of any fuel and oil residue that's leaked from the engine over the years. Rich keeps a lookout for any fires, while Billy watches and learns. Carefully, the team make their final cuts around the engine. Then, they cut the generator free. And with the torch work done, the components are ready to come out. It's one big engine and, you know, it's, some, it's got a lot of speed. It's something I like to have in my car. It's hot work and day two of a midsummer heat wave with temperatures topping 35 degrees. The only man enjoying himself now is crane operator Roy McNish. He's got over 40 years experience at Ehrman and air conditioning in the cab. It's a state-of-the-art crane, 350 horsepower with an 18-meter boom and a lifting capacity of over 14,500 kilograms. Just enough to lift the engine. That's if the chain holds. Like everything in the rail industry, it comes down to the strength of the weakest link. Billy gets in the saddle to attach the lifting chain. Basically, we're going to hook up right here in these holes, and we're going to pick it up, and we're going to set it over here in the ground. Everybody, Bill, we're going to go hook one right now and break it loose down here. OK. That's just go, go, go. Roy moves his rig into place. They chain up the crane arm and begin. The rig strains under the 14 and a half tons of weight. All right, now you're going to come off with it. All right, here he goes. A slip could damage the part, or even worse, kill a worker. So Roy moves it to the ground quickly. Number 672's largest component is free. I think we got it. It's good. Yeah. The engine's ready to be resold and refurbished. At National Maintenance and Repair in Hartford, Illinois, a rebuild team receives their new project. Burnt up or burnt out, Vice President John Sticht has seen it all. We never get an engine that looks pretty. His team of 34 mechanics rebuild and refurbish diesel engines for the marine and locomotive industry. So a 14,500 kilogram 16-cylinder locomotive engine isn't out of the ordinary for this custom-designed engine shop. Nearly 100 engines come through here every year. So mechanic Steve Miller and his team have the process down to a T. 
This is a power assembly. We tear them down and redo everything, do the valves, do the pistons, do the carriers and the rods. It'll be brand new when it's done. Watch my head. But first, the 16 cylinders need to come out. Swing it over and put it in the crate. What's left is the engine block, a 6,300 kilogram single piece of cast steel. The well, chances are that this block has been around since the 1960s and just been reconditioned a number of times. Locomotive steel can be recycled and reused indefinitely. It's the seals and gaskets that don't last. This is going to be noisy. They wear with time and cause leaks. It could be the valve guides in here leaking, leaking too much oil down in here and it's burning oil. The team strips each cylinder down to its individual components and throw only the gaskets and seals away. Some of these parts are older than me, and that's 52 years. It'd be nice if we could be taken apart and rebuilt and put back together again and run for another 50 years. Meanwhile, the team gets on with removing the crankshaft. This hardened steel rod rotates with the force of the pistons and provides the mechanical power to the generator. They blast the crankshaft clean with a special solvent that strips the oil and carbon buildup. Then the team puts the shaft through a rigorous truing process, turning it on a lathe to align it to the cradle. Rebuild specialist Brian Dar uses magnetic powder to examine the heads for cracks or fissures. As steel is heated, it expands, so even the smallest cracks can widen into fractures and weaken the steel. Quite a few little cracks in there, it's a scrap head. It does seem like a minute thing, but once it heats up and expands, it'll become a big one, so you don't want to even take a chance at it. And finally, they build back up what they took apart. You got it? Yeah. The team reattaches the crankshaft, puts the power assemblies back together with new gaskets and seals, and drops the cylinders back into the engine block. Ready, Jake? Come on down. It's looking good. They then run the engine at full throttle, checking for stress and oil leakage. Now this engine is ready to go back into a locomotive and run for another 40 years. Back in the Ehrman breakdown yard, Rich and his crew continue the locomotive's gut out. Next on their hit list, 672's generator. How you got that? That's how I got it, just like you got it. Now come on and put this in there. Oh, you better get it back away from her now. The team has already prepared the cuts, so this piece just pops out. That's going to be all right, Joe. Perfect, Rich perfect, is perfect, delighted. Perfect. perfect, King. Don't know better, Jack. Pretty good. Unlike the engine, the generator isn't in resale condition. But that doesn't mean they'll throw it away. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's packed pretty with good. copper and aluminium. The Roths plan to sell it to a specialty breakdown yard that will extract and sell the metals. I love the way it come out. I thought we were going to have a little problem with the generator, but we didn't snap right on out of there. With few words and plenty of gestures, Rich Dawson has kept the crew on schedule. Okay. Now he gives them their favorite Rich. sign. Dinner time. Good. We done good today. Good job. We done a good job today. Got a lot done today. At the end of the second day, Rich and his team have finished stage two, the gut out. Tomorrow, they'll move on to 672's final breakdown. Yesterday, you know, you could tell it was a locomotive, and today, we basically got a bed. Almost finished. So, tomorrow, we'll knock it out. But number 605 is waiting in the wings. 
the team still has a lot of locomotive to get through. The next day at the breakdown yard, it begins to drizzle. But that doesn't break the heat. Well, we got a storm coming, but uh, we're going to still keep working hard. The cutdown team, Billy Tolocco and Rich Dawson, have removed the main components of the SD40 locomotive. Now her parts are heading out to be recycled and reused. At Rich Metals in Davenport, Iowa, owner Rick Porter recycles train components for metals. A locomotive generator weighing 7,200 kilograms is about as good as it gets. Its shell is made of valuable steel, but the copper core is what Rick's after. That's the copper. Uh, that right there is 50% copper. They may say where there's muck, there's brass, but there's also a lot of cash in copper. But rich metals don't stop with separating the core. They still must strip all the copper from the core. For every job, the scrap industry has a tool. Years ago, we had to do this by hand until we bought the chair. Next, workers place the copper in the furnace. Temperatures topping 600 degrees Celsius melt down any residual insulating coating. After the copper cools, it's ready for shipment. Uh, each box is roughly 4,000 pounds. At a little over $3 a pound, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Rick's clients include the U.S. Mint, so chances are the proceeds of this locomotive generator will end up in his pocket in more ways than one. Back at Ehrman Corporation, Rich and Billy are breaking down two 160-ton locomotives. It's all be off, cut, it's all be cut off here. All this gets cut up, it goes all the way to the other end. So far, they've reduced locomotive 672 down to nothing but a bed, cab and wheels. Now it's time for her final breakdown. First up, 672's cab. It was the control center for the engineer who operates the locomotive. At 15 tons, it's loaded with valuable wire and components. Next, the team will take on the bed and truck assemblies. Each assembly is comprised of three axles and six 450 kilogram wheels. This group of parts supports the entire locomotive, so it's almost pure steel. Altogether, the team must still remove almost 41 tons of locomotive. So the next thing is when we cut this out, uh, let's... If we Before the team gets started, Ehrman's owners, Rob and Ted Roth, make a final assessment of the cab's salvageable parts. The market will tell us whether this is going to be valued for its parts or its, its, its whole. Locomotive technology has changed little over the decades, and neither has the brothers' family business. The locomotives that the dad and, and Walter Ehrman used to buy uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, had the same type of components, although older, uh, performed somewhat of the same functions. And here we are doing it again, 40, 50 years later. But to sell the components, they need to salvage them. Now it's all up to Rich and his team. They must cut away the steel shell, unbolt the seats and engineer console, then remove the electrical panels. Just hope that's a double wall there, where I pull that box out. If it is, I'll be in good shape. Otherwise, I don't know what to do. The torch burners could get the job done in minutes. But there's a problem. The cab still has six 130 kilogram batteries on board. They're filled with sodium hydroxide, or caustic acid, and must come out first. Full of acid is kind of dangerous, but uh, we try not to damage them. Even these parts have potential resale value. They might be in good condition, but they won't be easy to remove. The team can't pry them out manually. Over the years, the battery supports have rusted and fused with the locomotive frame. Well, you're going to have to cut the bolts out now. Get your torch here. So the team must burn the metal away. You watch it, battery get hot and it might blow up on you. I 
don't want nobody to get hurt. Fortunately for Rich, Billy's a quick learner. Yeah, hell of a man, Billy. Yeah, hell of a man. They've freed the batteries from the frame, but still need to pull them out. The light coating of rainwater doesn't make the parts any easier to handle. We get a couple more inches, we got it made. You know, get it over there. Get it up on this fork, got it made. <laughs> what do you have, y'all? It all makes forklift operator George Chris very nervous. When they start taking those batteries out, they're extremely heavy. One slip in a, a day like a day, weather like it is, a guy can get hurt or even worse, kill. While the team struggles with the bulky parts, there's the baby. Rob Roth gives some potential buyers from Mid America Railcar a tour of his locomotive inventory. Number 605 is their first stop. For 40 years, she's been transporting grain for the agriculture industry, and she's in good shape. Prospective buyer Bob Crane inspects every inch of her. Got a good cabinet in it, been rewired. Got a savings tank. The buyers move on to take a look at 672, or what's left of her. Are you looking for some hatches? Yeah, yeah. I could load, use a hatch to make a load box out of it. Okay. Well, that's, uh, yeah, we're Meanwhile, Rich and Billy finish removing the batteries. They're ready to start cutting down the cab. But Rob has some news. Well, we've got a change of plans right now. The buyers come back to us and they want the cab fully intact. They want it for another locomotive. The other locomotive was on a hold track in Minnesota and it was vandalized. They threw gasoline all over the control panel and set it on fire. And there's even better news for 605. The other good news is the fact that we just got a phone call from another buyer and the information that we've sent out on the 605, they're interested in buying it as is. This is one lucky locomotive. This one's got a reprieve and it's going back to work. For Rich, it's the one that got away. The same guy buying this cabinet is buying this. Yeah. What? When did we just leave us all together? Rich switches gears with the new game plan for 672. He'll have to get the cab off in one piece, so there's some locomotive grooming to be done. She'll need a nose job. But first, some toilet training. You really want to know? Here she comes. <laughs> that's pretty clean. <laughs> With the locomotive tidied up, the team readies the nose for the liftoff. When you get ready to stick your forks through that hole, where it's kind of raised it up, and I think it'll come off, and you tilt it back, and you, I'm just taking the nose off. George moves his forklift into place. He skewers the locomotive, unleashing a stream of sand. It's no surprise. The sand is stored in the nose for wheel traction. Sand comes out right out of this hole here. It blows the sand out on it, like this here. It comes out of there. It gives you, uh, gives you more traction on it. They got a heavy load of campus, you put some sand on it, like in the winter time, a lot of snow will get slick. Minutes later, George dumps his load of locomotive at the guillotine. Six seven two's nose is now nothing but sixty by sixty centimeter cubes of prime steel. Ready for shipment to the SSAB steel mill in Muscatine, Iowa. It's a 100% recycling mill, meaning they don't make new steel, they only process scrap. But the scrap must be clean of contamination, so General Manager Ed DeCicio must check every incoming shipment. 
This is a load of incoming scrap. There's two functions being performed. We're weighing each individual car, and we're also scanning it for radiation. Steel from other sources, like hospitals or military sites, could be radioactive. So Ed is a big fan of rail steel. Richard, we detecting anything? No, we are not. No, we are not. That's great. It's pure. To accept anything else would cripple the company. If radioactive material got into our process, basically the entire plant would have to shut down. It would be completely disastrous. Workers use a network of magnet cranes to sort the scrap by shape and size, and then load it into a 100-ton capacity scrap bucket. Once the bucket is full, the team moves it into the 112 megawatt electric arc furnace, where the steel is melted to temperatures of over 1,600 degrees Celsius. After they melt the steel, the crew pours off any residual impurity or slag. From a control room outside the furnace, workers add other chemicals to give the steel greater strength, flexibility or weight. I just put in uh, a couple hundred pounds of uh, manganese, uh, uh, about 400 pounds of lime to take the sulfur out of the steel. Next, they position the bucket over the form line and direct the melted steel onto the moulds. On the other end, mechanical conveyors push, cut and roll out the final product, steel plates. And finally, SSAB conducts one last test for purity. Using an ultrasonic scanner, a worker surveys the steel for foreign objects or air bubbles. This is the final test before it goes out the door. This recycled steel is used for everything from appliances to cars, building struts and beams, even new locomotives. But the end product for today's load of processed steel is surprising even for Ed. In the last five years we've gone from 10,000 tons to this year we'll ship close to 370,000 tons of product going to wind towers. This steel is for wind turbines and the demand has never been greater. Old technology is now recycled into new technology. But back in the breakdown yard, Rich and Billy are still dealing with old technology. I got hung up here somewhere. A 1966 locomotive cab. It may be vintage, but this cab's got a buyer. So it must come out intact. But the cab's designed to withstand collisions of up to 48 kilometers per hour. It's tightly secured to the frame and connected to the bed by hundreds of cables. So the team's biggest challenge still lies ahead. At Erman Corporation, it's the end of the line for locomotive 672. Rich Dawson and his team have removed everything but her cab, bed and wheels. Well, Brent, go come right up here. Now it's time to take the cab off. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna save. No, I'm gonna save all the steel. But to do that, the team must separate it from the bed, which means climbing beneath the undercarriage and torching blind in the confined space. The cab's valued at up to thirty thousand dollars. So Rich's boss, Rob Roth, wants the removal done right. Around here a little bit. See, we ain't gonna damage much here if we do it just like this. Well, I realize that, but you know what's gonna happen? Yeah, I don't wanna do it. I, I'm gonna keep it come break loose and I'm gonna set it back down. I know I'll put it around there. Okay. They agree on a game plan, and Rich gets straight to work. The team hooks the cab up to a crane so it won't topple as they free it from the frame. The torch burners make their cuts around the cab. The crane operator gives the cab a tug, but something's holding it. Jake, I'm hook. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Billy has a hunch what it is. Hey, Rich, got that firewall. 
firewall we didn't ever cut underneath uh -huh. the wires. Do what? That firewall we didn't cut underneath the wires going across. Where? In the back. Yeah, we work out where? They cut the wires? That part back there, the back, all the way across. That's still connected. What? No, no, uh -huh. I did. Shouldn't be that shit with that box. Tell them to hold that a minute. Hold that thing, man. Finally, the team uncovers the problem. They ain't gonna see it. An uncut cable hidden under a metal plate. Yeah, there you go. And now you do it. Now you got it. You got it going now. I'm ready to go now in about two seconds. It's okay to have one chain, Roy. Yeah, it's okay. Absolutely okay. Go for it. The cab comes off, and they ready her for the new owner. All that remains of 672 is her bed and truck assemblies. It's time for the final breakdown. Bring your torch! Rich gives his marching orders. Go ahead, cut this here. Go, go, go! The over 7 centimeter thick solid steel bed is no match for the burners as they cut the locomotive in two. They flip the bed over. And roll the truck assemblies away. Uh, that's pretty much it, you know. It's not rocket science, but, you know, that's what we do. The only thing left to do now is cut down the steel into manageable chunks. But Rich has other plans. I am not cutting. Not done for the day and all day. For him, this breakdown is over. Oh, dig or death, I'm ready. I gotta go back to home. Translation, he's going home. He's officially retired. It's time for Rich to literally pass the torch. And Billy's ready to receive it. Uh, it doesn't bother me to get dirty or nothing like that. You know, I just love it, you know. I love it to death, you know. I love to work hard. He gets his own set of leathers and cuts up the final pieces. The team may be finished. But Locomotive 672's new life has only just begun. Name your price. Good. Ted Roth has found buyers for most of 672's main components. What's left is a rail car's worth of scrap steel, ready to be recycled into new rail products. Like a phoenix from the flames, every part of this locomotive will return to use in some form, allowing the rail industry to roll on. Generator, there was a question mark. Most likely we're going to scrap this. Their cut and keep list may have been easy to make, but the true challenge still lies ahead. They'll need to systematically dismantle the locomotives, cutting through solid steel without damaging the internal components or their auxiliary parts. A locomotive is designed to be almost indestructible. In this case, a 160-ton construction of cast and welded steel. Each piece must be taken out with precision, by hand, with blowtorches. The breakup will happen from the top down in three stages. Stage one, the strip down. Cut and skin the steel outer shell of the locomotive to expose its power core. Stage two, the gut out. Remove the locomotive's internal workings, the prime mover and generator. And stage three, the final breakdown. 
cut away the cap and torch through the over seven centimeter thick solid steel locomotive bed to salvage the wheels and supports. It's a job that takes experience, skill and a healthy respect for locomotives. Rich Dawson's the man for the job. Iron, cast iron. You can tell by hitting it, the sound. He's been in the business over 30 years and knows how to handle a fuel tank. You hear a hollow sign, that's when it's empty. Oh, yeah, some of them, I cut, I cut, I cut a lot of these up. A lot of them come at full, uh, full about 3,500 gallon of fuel in them. Yeah, I have it pumped out. Oh, yeah, catch on fire. But fire's not the only risk. Come on, George. Rich and his team are dealing with 160 tons of locomotive. An accident with even a smaller component could crush anything or anybody in its way. Couple of over, caught him at the slam. Rich knows this from experience. They snapped them fingers off right there. In 1966, he was hooking up a pair of locomotives when they moved together and took a third of his hand with them. They didn't even smash them from here up. Just pinch them off. I could, I could took them, pull them off like that. But Rich got his revenge. Since then, he's cut up over 5,000 locomotives, and he's itching to get started on this one. If you can't hear on this other side, I couldn't. No, right here. This is way too heavy. No, 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 no. You can lift it over that thing. Here. Come on, we're across. Right. Number 672 will be the first to go. From trucks to sedans, she's hauled freight for the auto industry for 40 years. But today, her time is up. Take it out, put it down. Rich calls in his troops. They get straight to work on stage one, the strip down. First, Rich needs to cut off the doors and rails. He shows the cutters where to begin. Okay, cut some doors off so we can see to get up in there and cut them bolts off. Now, hey, let him cut in half. The rails and doors may have come off easily, but the strip down's only just begun. Rich and his team get ready to rumble. It's a scorching day in the breakdown yard. And now it's about to get even hotter. The team needs to cut through layers of over seven centimeter thick solid steel and blow torches are the only way to do it. The flame is 50% acetylene gas and 50% oxygen, the only mixture that burns hot enough to cut steel, at 3,480 degrees Celsius, to be exact. Direct contact with this heat could be deadly. So each worker must wear a face shield and protective clothing called leathers. But the flames aren't the only hazard. A machine this old is a potential powder keg. Oil and fuel residue are all over this locomotive. One wrong move with a blowtorch could ignite an explosion. So Rich must make sure his team stays clear of any residual combustibles. Working at Rich's side is Billy Tolocco. He's new to Ehrman, but not to the rail industry. His old job was with the train derailment team. When a train crashed, he cleaned it up. Scrapping this out, it's all new to me. This is my first locomotive. He's hoping to take over for Rich at the end of this project. I got all of them, Rich. Huh? I got all of them. Got them all. This is Rich's last breakdown. He's 70 years old and headed for retirement. But Billy will need to learn rich speak if he's going to follow in the master's footsteps. Got five foot? Yeah, he better whack at me. Translation, Rich wants the team to keep cutting. He knows they've got a lot of work to do. There's not one, but two 160-ton locomotives to cut down. 
and they've only just begun. As the torch burners slice through the steel shell, Billy begins removing any exposed cabling. But these aren't your everyday wires. These two and a half centimeter cables are packed with copper threads. Oh, this one's stubborn. Oh, oh you got to hold two of them. You got to, there you go, now you got it. You had to hold two of them. Okay. Number one copper, right there. A locomotive this size has about 200 kilograms of copper wiring. At current prices, this could mean over a thousand dollars for the Roth brothers. But under 672's shell, there's even more potential for profit. Her engine and generator could fetch over a quarter of a million dollars. That's if Rich and his team can get to them. But so far, the strip down is on track. It's the first stage of the locomotive cut down. Rich Dawson and Billy Tolocco must remove 672's shell to expose her internal workings. The temperature is approaching 35 degrees. But so far, Billy's enjoying himself. You know, I love it, you know, and I enjoy the weather. You know, I just love it, you know. I love it to death, you know. Inside the office, Ehrman's co-owner, Ted Roth, puts calls in to prospective parts buyers. Jim, how are you? Ted Roth calling with Ehrman Corporation. See, I wanted to chat with you about some locomotive equipment we've got available for sale. Any component Ted doesn't sell will go for scrap. It was rebuilt in 2000. To the uninitiated, the term scrap implies a low value, a throwaway commodity. But scrap metals, particularly steel, have been the building blocks of industry for decades. Now, with improved recycling technology, the demand for scrap is even greater. Technology has come a long way in the recycling industry. And as a result of that, we're going to go back and start touching things that once upon a time was regarded as garbage. As an example, landfills. It wouldn't surprise me at the least within our lifetime that we'll start to see re reclamation of landfills for no other reason but to go and reclaim metals, plastics that can be recycled. Thousands of new products are made with recycled metals every year. So it's a very good time to be a scrap dealer. And a locomotive is pretty much all metal. Ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Ferrous being steel, non-ferrous being the copper and aluminum and brass that we would find on the locomotives, um, are at all-time highs. Prices that we've never seen before. Maybe never see again. That means every chunk of steel off this locomotive is worth recycling. Rich's team cut the doors and rails away from number 672. Next, they start on the two and a half centimeter thick steel shell that covers the locomotive's internal workings. Carefully, it's cut away from the bed. It takes three hours to get the job done. Got everything cut and everything ready? Everything's cut and ready. Everything cut and ready. Let's go, bring the crane. Now they prep the skin for crane operator Roy McNish to lift it off. All right, ready, let's go. His task is going to be tricky. The pieces are big and bulky. Any uncut metal or cabling makes his job even harder. Cut this off first. Finally, he removes all the pieces. They're steel, so they're headed to the mill for scrap. But first, the team must crush the oversized pieces into manageable chunks and Ehrman's got the right tool for the job. The 370 ton 1123 Harris guillotine shearer. Like an oversized jaw, it crushes with 1,000 tons of downward force. 
Then a 90 kilogram hardened steel blade slices through the crushed remains, spitting out 60 centimeter steel cubes. The cubes get weighed before shipment to the steel mill. To earn its keep, this hungry monster needs to process up to 245 tons of steel a day. So it's fed on a constant diet of rail cars. Ehrman is set up to process the rail cars like a production line. First, they remove all the salvageable parts, the brake systems, couplers and wheel assemblies. Next, a torch team cuts horizontally along the steel frame. 